beyond the resurrection and everything that Jesus did for us at the cross and an empty tomb still makes a difference in our lives every single day. And we're here to worship him today, but we want to start off with a time of prayer and welcome. If you're a first time guest, there are visitor cards at the table in the back of the room, along with the sermon notes for today's sermon. If you would do us a favor, if it's your first time, while we welcome each other in just a, a few moments, if you'd grab one of those cards, fill it out, and any information you ask us, we'll send to you in the mail. We use those cards to pray for you. We won't bother you in any way unless it's something you mark on that card you want from us, but it's, it's a way that we know that you're visiting with us, and it just gives us an opportunity to connect with you, and so if you would do that, it'd be a great benefit for us from the staff's point of view, because we love praying for you, and this is a church that believes in prayer, and you'll see prayer lists across the front in these holders, and several prayer requests came in yesterday. They're at the top of the list, and, and so we've got a lot of needs in life for our church. Uh, Ed Miller was in our service last night. His mom, Miss Margaret, had a severe stroke, and uh, she's 93. She's had a great life, but she's suffering now in a hospital in Gainesville, Georgia. And so Ed and his sister were here last night. They're traveling to Gainesville to be with their mom, and so she's at the top of the list, along with several people that have just recently lost loved ones. We've got over 10 people on this list dealing with cancer um, that are fighting uh, that, that battle. And so they've asked you to pray for them. So you can see it on our website, the same prayer list, or just a few moments when I start a prayer time, you can come and grab one of these prayer lists and start praying. You can grab somebody in the middle of the service and start praying for them because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God changes people's hearts and lives. We also want you to know, uh, that during the sermon today, or right before the sermon, there's going to be a song Billy Reynolds is going to sing. He sang it last night, and it was a holy ground moment. That's the only way, way I know how to describe it. This song was written by Jaron Davis, who wrote Holy Ground that Scott Hanbury connected me with, and he wrote this song for Charity Gale. And it's not completely out yet for everybody else to hear. Only a few churches have it. And so Jaron sent me the music, and as soon as he sent it to me, I said, Billy Reynolds needs to sing this song, and man, he can sing it, and uh, has the heart to sing it, and the attitude behind it, and this, this song is called Back to the Garden, and I want you to use it as a prayer before I preach this morning. I want you to ask God to take you back to the relationship that he originally created for you to be and to have with him, to get back to that point in your life where it was just like you just got saved, before things got in the way before distractions and doubts came in, you just want to get back there. And so it's a beautiful, beautiful song that I think will put you in the presence of the Lord in a powerful way. So that's coming in just a moment. But thank you for being here today. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that we get to pray to you to start this service. Thank you for the number of people that are wanting prayer because they believe in this church and they believe in you. They believe we'll lift it up and they'll believe you'll answer. And I praise you for that. So God, for the needs that are in front of us, as we lift them up to you, would you do what only you can do? You have the power to heal, the power to save, the power to transform people's lives. The same power that raised you from the dead lives inside of every believer in this room. And so we trust in you today even through difficulties and distractions and doubts we trust in you lord thank you for this time to go to you in prayer in jesus name
God, we give you praise today for Jake and for Christina, for Greg and for Don and for Helen. Thank you that because you worked in their hearts and lives, they're doing better. We keep on praying for them, but we thank you and praise you for being a God who heals. God, I do pray for Ed and his sister and his family as they go down to see Miss Margaret, that you would please be with them and give them not only protection as they travel, but bless them, God, as they deal with their mom. And thank you for her long life. And we pray, God, that when it's your perfect time and will for her life to go to be with you, that you would make that as painless as possible. God, for Miss Martha Ann Finch that was on our list, friend of Nancy's, now it's the family of Martha Ann Finch. And she just learned right before the service that she passed away. And I pray for Nancy and I pray for this family that you would please be near to them. Be with them as they walk through the grieving process. God, I pray for the family of Ed Swindoll. The funeral was yesterday. And just pray that you would be with that wife and three children. God, thank you for John King coming through a hip replacement and pray that you'd be with him as he recovers. There's so many needs, God, that we think about. Miss Teresa Wing will pray over her to end the service, but I pray you would be with her and Mark in a special way and they would know of your healing power and your mercy and your grace. God, I pray for people that may have walked in this room this morning with doubt and I pray that you would take them from their doubt to a deeper devotion with you that they would be able to get back to the garden where it all started in their walk with you. Thank you so much for this church and the privilege of being a part of it. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst. And I pray, God, that the excitement that we shared three services over Easter weekend will be the same excitement we get to share with you every time we meet with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before we sing songs to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and let's fellowship through the power of the Holy Spirit. When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, sing that with us if you would. My fear doesn't stand a chance. When I
never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the good name. can have a seat this morning. Billy, come on up.
because he does want to take us back. Last week we looked at life's greatest discovery and we looked at the tomb being rolled away. Last, if you were in the Easter program, you knew that when we did the dress rehearsal, two things happened to Jesus in the dress rehearsal. I'm laying back there on what I thought was one long bench that they had for me last year and it had a, a white cloth over it and I realized when I was sitting on it that they had put two different pieces together because they couldn't find the long one so I'm sitting with a big crack between it and I got to lean up in a gown without falling over and so I'm thinking the whole time in this practice that because some people came that couldn't come and they're watching the practice and we're trying to do it like the real thing and I'm thinking when this the fog fills up this little room I got to close my eyes because I can't see anything and it gets in my eyes and all, the light shows, they turn that big light on and I'm going to try to sit up without falling over because that looks dumb if the stone rolls away and Jesus falls off the thing and then stands back up. Just kind of takes away a little bit of the coming out. And so I'm really worried about sitting up. And so I go to get up and I'm like, something doesn't feel right. And the stone didn't roll away and I didn't know it. And so there's this big delay. The dancers had to stop and turn around, I was told, because I'm still stuck in the tomb. And finally, they get the stone rolled away. And I'm not going to tell you who it was, Steve Wally, but he, he had put a piece of wood lower than he did last year, and the stone hit and wouldn't roll. Sometimes we act like Jesus is still in the tomb the week after Easter, when in fact, he's risen every single day. And he makes a difference in his life's greatest discovery that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do. This week, I want to give you a message in this series and I couldn't, couldn't settle on a message title, so I gave you two. First one is the man who missed Easter. But the second is the whole intent of the message, overcoming doubt. Here's the fundamental question regarding the Christian faith is does the empty tomb of Easter change who we are? How has Easter made a difference in your life this past week? Are you still dealing with doubts? Some of you may be dealing with disbelief. And that's why I wanted that song sung this morning because I wanted you to know that God can take you back to the way, place it all started. You can feel the way you feel the day you got saved. It's not supposed to change. It's not supposed to get weaker. It's supposed to get stronger because resurrection power does that from Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our lives. But I want to share something this morning that's a misconception a lot of people have. A lot of people put doubt and disbelief as synonymous things. In fact, people will tell you, you're never supposed to doubt. You should never doubt. And I'm going to tell you, according to Scripture, doubt can be a good thing to lead you back into a stronger belief. In fact, I want to share with you the biblical meanings of these two words so you'll understand the difference between doubt and disbelief because we're going to talk about doubting Thomas this morning. And by the way, we gave him that name, right? The Bible doesn't give him that name. We put that name on him. But if you look up the word doubt in the original language in the Greek New Testament, it means double-minded. And like James says, uh, that man is unstable in all his ways. He's double-minded. And what that means is you can hear a song like that and you can, you can think you could walk into hell with a water pistol right now, right? Because, man, God came down and I'm full of Holy Spirit and everything feels good because I'm in church on a Sunday morning two weeks after Easter. But then let trouble hit tomorrow. And what you believe so strongly in today, you can start to doubt on Monday if you're not careful, and you can be double-minded. I know that doesn't describe anybody in the room but me, right? But then if you look at the word disbelief in the biblical definition, it's completely different. Disbelief has been defined as that deliberate denial and resistance that leads to disobedience and rebellion. Doubt is always... Uh, not always condemned in Scripture, but disbelief is. And we think, don't doubt. And I want to share with you some things about Thomas today that I want you to see in a, hopefully a new way. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about descending into doubt. He descends into it, but then we've got to learn to disarm it. It's not wrong to have doubt, but it's wrong to stay in doubt. 
Doubt should lead you to a stronger faith. And before I get to the text in John 20 that picks up where we left off last week, I got to show you something about Thomas that most people miss in Scripture so you'll understand who he was before he got the name. John chapter 11, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Two resurrections around Thomas. And in John chapter 11, verse 14, you find these words. So he told them plainly, Jesus did, his disciples, he told them, Lazarus is dead. But then he says this, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. What? You're glad you wasn't there, Jesus? For now you will really believe. Now I'll take your doubt, and I can take your doubt and change it into belief. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin. What's up, twin? My twin is here. I told Bible study class this morning that there's something you don't like about our church. Ray's sitting right over there. <laughs> He's never going to come back. Thomas had a nickname. Thomas's nickname was Didymus. You ever heard the phrase ditto? All right. So Thomas had a twin, and we don't know the name of his twin. You're going to see it mentioned again when we get to John chapter 20. Thomas has a twin, and guess what? I think we are all Thomas's twin. I think sometimes we're just like him. And look what it says. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. Sound like doubting Thomas to you? I mean, he's ready to die. Jesus hadn't said nothing about dying. He just said, I'm going to go and rise somebody from the dead. And, and he automatically got this thing in his mind. There's just going to be this fight when this happens, and we're going to stand up for Jesus. Come on, other disciples, let's go. Let's die with him. Because it's easy to say one thing about Jesus one minute and struggle with him the next. Just ask John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist who baptized Jesus and said, I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals and after me is going to come someone who baptized you with Holy Spirit and fire, then he gets in a jail cell. Circumstances have changed. You know what Thomas says from a, I mean, uh, John the Baptist says from a jail cell? I go and see if he's really the one we thought he was. You know what Jesus, the word Jesus sends back is? Hey, tell him that you see people healed and miracles take place. Tell him things are going on just fine out here. He just thinks different because he's in there. Because doubt comes to every believer. In fact, I want to show you this with a couple of scriptures because as I study scripture, I put these in your handout. Don't have room to put them, the text there, but you're going to see the text on the screen. I'm going to show you two times in scripture where doubt is condemned and two times in scripture doubt is encouraged. So you see the balance between the two. First one's in Matthew 14. There's a storm and Jesus is up on a mountainside praying. The disciples are in the boat. Things aren't going good. They're getting tossed all over the place. Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Verse 28, then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, if, we all have our if moments. Tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus says. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? You know what's interesting about that scripture? It's because the you there is plural. So who is Jesus talking to? Is he talking to Peter or the other disciples that are still in the boat? Different theologians differ on who they think Jesus is talking to. You know what my answer is? All of them. Why? Because we're not supposed to doubt. We're supposed to have greater faith. But sometimes we've got to get from that small faith to greater faith by struggling through some doubt. Matthew 21 Verse 18, in the morning as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry. He noticed a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs, but there were only leaves. And he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? 
And then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. You can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you'll receive it. So at times Jesus said, don't doubt, get past the doubt. But then look at these two scriptures, Mark chapter 9. Man has a son who often throws himself down in public and convulses in front of people. And the man has done everything he can to try to get some healing to his son. So he brings him to Jesus. And in verse 21 of Mark 9, how long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father, who replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. If. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe. But help me overcome my unbelief. Anybody want to say that prayer this morning? I mean, God, I I believe. But I still have some doubts that I struggle with. I believe in you, but help me to believe in you more. Help me in the areas I still have trouble with. And Jesus heals him. But this is the one that really stands out to me. It's Matthew 28. It's right before the Great Commission. Verse 16, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Some of who? Now it's the 11. The ones that saw Jesus raised up from the dead for 40 days. Some of them saw Jesus and they still had doubts. You know what Jesus didn't say to them? He didn't say, okay, everybody with doubts get over here. Everybody's got big faith, get over here. And y'all guys over here go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. But y'all guys doubt it. He gives the same commission to both of them, to both groups. He didn't fix their doubt first, because he knew what doubt could do in the long run. It could grow their faith. In fact, I was doing some reading in a Several people came to mind, theologians that think the same way, see it from Scripture. A couple of those you don't have on your notes. Herman Hess said this, faith and doubt go hand in hand. They're complementaries of each other. One who never doubts will never truly believe. J.C. Ryle said, doubting does not prove that a man has no faith, but only that his faith is small and still needs to grow. Henry Drummond, you have on your handout and on the screen. Henry Drummond said, Christ never failed to distinguish between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is can't believe. Unbelief is won't believe. Doubting is looking for light. Unbelief is still content with the darkness. But my favorite one is Frederick Buechner. He said, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. You see, some of you that were taught all your life, if you're doubting, that's wrong. You should never doubt. Just believe it because somebody told you to believe it. Some of you in this room, some of your greatest strengths in your faith is where you struggle with doubt in order to get to a stronger faith with Jesus. And because you had to struggle, because you had to pray, because you had to work through some things in your life, because your mind told you one thing and faith in God told you another, you had to work to get there. And now you have a stronger faith because you work through your doubts and your disbelief. And I see this in the situation with doubting Thomas. So I want to do something that I normally don't do. I normally read the scripture all up front and preach back through it, but I want to teach through this scripture as I share some points of application. He's going to descend into doubt, and then he's going to learn to disarm the doubt in his life. Here's descending into doubt, because doubt always leads us down a path, and it first starts off with a path of desertion. Remember in, in in the Passion Play, when Jesus gets arrested, I heard some snickers on this side of the room as the guards are carrying me out. And I'm thinking, what's funny about me getting arrested? But they were laughing at the disciples scurrying out of the room because they all fled. They, 
What happened was not what they thought was going to happen. And so now they're dealing with doubt. And Thomas deserts Jesus too. Because when you doubt, sometimes you push away from the only one who has all the answers. And look at it. Pick up in verse 19 of John chapter 20. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. That's a strong group of men. Let's get where nobody can find us and make sure the doors are locked. But Jesus doesn't care about locked doors. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Bing! I mean, what happened today if Jesus just showed up on your aisle? And look at what Jesus says. Peace be with you. Notice what he doesn't say. Bunch of chickens. (laughs) Why you got the door locked? I couldn't even get in. The first thing he does is meet them where they are. Because he's a God who loves you. The first thing he says is he knows they're scared, so he says, Shalom. I just want to make sure you're at peace. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Remember last week we talked about what it really means to see him and experience him? Again, he said, because it's just like Jesus, peace be with you. Twice. He says the same thing because he wants more than anything to get people from their doubt to a place of peace. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What a powerful moment. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, and so we didn't forget it from John 11, nicknamed the twin was not with the others when Jesus came. Where was Thomas? Not only had Thomas deserted Jesus, he got away from his group. You know, it's interesting when people start dealing with doubt, a lot of them stop coming to church for a while. Because they can't figure out what's going on in their heart and mind, and so they push away from the truth being told to them because it convicts them, and sometimes they just want to get away from everybody else. Because the devil always loves to divide and conquer. You take a piece of wood out of your fireplace, away from all the other fire that's burning, and it'll go out pretty quick. And that's what happened with Thomas. He just wasn't where he's supposed to be because he had doubt. And the doubt caused him to desert Jesus and to desert the rest of the disciples. And as a result, he missed out on an incredible blessing. Second, doubt leads us down the path of delay. Not only does it lead us to desert God and the family of faith, but it delays some things God wants in our life. Look at verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. I mean, imagine that conversation. Imagine how that went. Man, we saw him, Thomas. You should have been here. I can imagine old Peter saying, he threw me a football in the upper room. It was great. It was right over the shoulder. He stood and talked with us. We actually saw him. We saw the nail prints in his hands. We saw the nail prints in his feet. We saw the wound in his side. But he replied, I won't believe. He's calling the rest of them liars. Y'all didn't see Jesus. I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. But look at this. Eight days later, The disciples were together again. Eight days. Anybody in the room this morning fall short of the glory of God and in one moment God comes walking the cool of your day and you lose everything in one day? And you have that pit in your stomach that all the things you've been hiding from God are now public in front of God? You got that pit in your stomach like there's no hope left for you? Anybody been there? Can't eat. Can't sleep. But it could all go away if you just meet Jesus. But you're like that for eight days. Eight days you don't know he's alive. Eight days you don't know there's any hope. Eight days you deal with that. Two nights ago. Sitting in my recliner, it's all quiet in the house. 
finally quiet in the house. And I get back up from bed, go in my living room and sit in a chair. And I'm sitting there and I had the most unbelievable encounter with the Lord. Carter's getting married this weekend. So it's your last Sunday to be single. <laughs> Enjoy. And I'm thinking about all that God has done. I'm, almost four years ago, I lost everything. My whole family's here today. My in-laws, my whole family, my brother's here. And I'm, just, I'm just sitting thinking how good God is and how, how I had nothing. Took out my phone. I'll, I'll prove it to you. Sit like by Stacy if you don't believe me. And I typed what God put on my heart in the notes section of my phone. And here's what I wrote. When I was at the end of my rope, you pulled me up to new heights. Thank you, Jesus. But my doubt led me to delay all that God wanted for me for so long. He wanted to show me sooner, but I pushed him away. And to me, it was much more than eight days. But Thomas should have been there. And then he should have believed what the other disciples said because he was with them for three years. They wouldn't lie to him. But because of where he was in his own life, he had deserted God, and now he's delayed everything that God wants for him. Number three, doubt leads us down the path of denial. It starts with you not being where you're supposed to be because you got some doubts. Now you delay everything God has for you. You put it on hold, and then you end up getting to a place where you deny who Jesus is. Back in verse 25, they told him, we've seen the Lord, but he replied, I won't believe. I won't do it because I got doubts. I just won't do it. I can't get there right now. I won't do it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my finger into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. I just won't believe. And maybe that's you today. Maybe because you pushed God away for so long and you missed him when he showed up that you're at that place where you say i won't believe unless god does something and look it gets even worse it goes from desertion to delay to denial and then it leads down to a path where you're actually demanding that god do certain things look what it says he said i won't believe unless i see the nail wounds in his hands god here's what you got to do look anytime you start bossing god around you're in big trouble Anytime you start saying, God, I don't believe, but if you do this, this, and this, anybody ever prayed for a sign? Me? I did. And so, God, you've got to do it this way or I won't believe. I've got to see the nail wounds in your hands. I've got to put my fingers into those wounds because seeing them just won't be enough. Then I've got to put my hand into your side because the first two won't do it unless I get the third one. And you start making demands on God that he has to do it your way. Well, how do you get to devotion? How do you disarm doubt? Because you know what I love about Jesus? Even though Thomas demanded him, he did just what Thomas asked. Because he's God. And he wants to disarm any doubt in your life. Some things I see here real quick that I think we need if you're going to get from doubt to a devotion to Jesus is draw close to Jesus. That's why you can't desert him. That's why you can't push away. I mean, I grew up in a society that said you should never question God. Look, I, I got a pre-med degree, so I grew up with this right brain analytical way of thinking, and almost everybody in the field that me and Ricky were in were, were lost because they couldn't prove Jesus so they didn't believe him. They could prove a, a scientific formula. They could prove a math equation, but they couldn't prove Jesus. So I had a lot of questions growing up. I had big questions, and I would ask them to my pastor, and sometimes my pastor would get frustrated. And he would say things to me like, you should never question God. And I got so tired of hearing that. 
to one morning sitting in his office at Temple Baptist Church, I asked him another question and he, he got so frustrated. He said, I told you, you should never question God. And before I even knew what I was saying, it came out. Why not? He's got all the answers. I mean, who else am I going to bring my questions to? Are we just supposed to act like we don't doubt when we really do? And no, I'm never going to question you, God, when he's waiting to send the answer. And the way he sends the answer is when you draw close to him. Remember, the reason that Thomas is doubting is because he wasn't in the room when Jesus showed up. So Jesus shows up and everything changes. Look at verse 26. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. He says the same thing he said twice before. Peace. You know what he didn't say? Where, where's Thomas? Where's Thomas? I can imagine Peter going, he's right over here. He said he wouldn't believe. But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't walk through the, the wall and show up and go, where's the doubter? He walked in and said, I want everybody to be at peace. Hey, Thomas. He doesn't scold you when you doubt. He loves you. He doesn't get on to you. He draws you close to him. Because he wants you to be at peace. He's not upset at your doubt. He just wants to deliver you from it so you'll be at peace in your soul. Because he saved you so that you can have a relationship with him. And the closer you get to him, the more you see him. And the more you see him, the more the doubts fade. The problem is we go weeks at a time without seeing him. And we wonder why doubts pop in. And the more Jesus shows up in front of us, the more we say, my Lord and my God. But you got to get close to Jesus. Don't push him away. Don't run from him. Don't deny him. Don't demand things from him. Just draw back close to Jesus. Even when you don't understand it, even if you don't know how it's going to make sense, even if you think he's going to get on to me, he's going to say, peace. Peace. But then after you draw close to Jesus, depend on the evidence. I'm not saying have blind faith in God, just believe because this pastor told you to believe. I mean, look at the evidence. In fact, the stone has been rolled away. He heard the women go to the tomb and come back and say, hey, we don't know where they put Jesus. Then the disciples told him, he showed up in this room and you weren't here. And we put our hands in the nail prints on his hands. We put our hands into his side. There was evidence, and now the third evidence, Jesus shows back up in front of him. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Imagine that encounter. He's touching the flesh of Jesus. Jesus is who he says he is. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Experience who I am right now. And I know what y'all are thinking. I see the bubbles pop up over your head. Well, Brother Ray, I would if he showed up here. I mean, like you came out of the tomb a couple weeks ago. If Jesus would come out, I'd believe. I mean, if I could touch the nail prints in his hand, if I could put my hand into the wound of his side, I'd stop doubting and I'd believe too. Well, God has given you two different evidences that Scripture says is greater than seeing Jesus in person. Here's one. And the Holy Spirit inside of you is the other. The Holy Spirit, Scripture says, witnesses with your spirit that he is who he says he is. And so just depend on the evidence. Number three, declare your allegiance to God. Sometimes you have to do it and you have to fake it till you make it. But look at this, it's the greatest statement of submission, I believe, in all of Scripture. Verse 28, my Lord and my God. You know what he said with my Lord? You're boss and I'm not. My Lord means I submit to you. My God means I believe you're sovereign. 
I submit your Lord and God. I submit. You're standing right there, I submit. There's no one greater than you. This is his back to the garden moment. Then Jesus told him, here's why I say, that you can have a stronger faith than Thomas. You believe because you see me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Now you're going to be more blessed than Thomas who saw him in the flesh if you can push through your doubts and have stronger faith in Jesus. The same Thomas who said, my Lord and my God, you can have greater faith than Thomas. But you got to declare your allegiance. And number four, devote yourself to the word. Devote yourself to the word. Look at this in the last two verses of John 20. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written, these are written so that you may what? Continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. These are written so that you can get past your doubt and believe. The Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. That's why you have to devote yourself to this book. Elsewhere in Scripture, it says that if all that Jesus Christ had done was put down on paper, all the volumes in the world wouldn't hold it. I mean, just imagine for just a moment this morning that the Bible was not 66 books that you could hold in your hand like I'm holding. Let's imagine that they tried to put everything Jesus said and everything Jesus did in volumes, and it was not the Encyclopedia Britannica, it was the Encyclopedia Beloved. And it was 36 volumes, 1,500 pages apiece, and everybody had to buy the encyclopedia of Jesus to read the story of Jesus. And so you go up in my office, and one whole wall of my office is dedicated to all those volumes of encyclopedias. We got people who have trouble reading this. And I say that to say this, if it's in here, it's important. If it made it here, of all the things they could say about Jesus, if it gets in here, there's nothing in here that doesn't matter. And so he said, I wrote all these things. You got all this. So when you're reading and studying God's word, the doubt seems to fade and your belief gets stronger. You, you got doubt, open the book. The veil has been torn. Billy sang about it. So all of us have an opportunity to read Scripture and the Holy Spirit speak to us and say, He's right here, my Lord and my God. He wants those kind of moments when you study your Word every single day. He wants you to read a Scripture and go, my Lord and my God. You are who you say you are. And check this. Several years ago, I went to India. And I was... I trained pastors in three different sections of India. My favorite section was the southern tip of India, of Kerala. In a Gospel for Asia pastor school, and you get there and you walk into this pastor school, and when you walk into the, the foyer of their sanctuary, it's bigger than this sanctuary, just the entrance to it. And when you walk in, there's nothing but sandals stacked everywhere. So you walk in, you're like, okay, it's my first time here. Everybody else took off their shoes, I take mine off. Put them in there, walk in, nobody wears shoes into the sanctuary because you're standing on holy ground. All the pastors up on the platform, just barefoot. So I get up barefoot and I walk over and look out there and everybody's got bare feet because this is holy ground. And I stand up and try to train them. Cries out of place. And everywhere I went in India, everywhere I went, St. Thomas Church of Kerala, St. Thomas Church of this town, St. Thomas Church of that town. I'm like, to the pastors there, I'm like, why is every church named St. Thomas? I said, oh, did you not read the Fox's Book of Martyrs? I said, not all of it. Well, you should have read all of it because the story is that St. Thomas, Thomas, this doubting Thomas, said, my Lord and my God, to the degree that he gave his life for telling other people that Jesus is alive. And he went to India because he thought God called him to go there and he wouldn't stop preaching Jesus. And so they killed him.
but his legacy is in the names of churches. They don't call him Doubting Thomas. Seems to me he got back to John 11. Let's go and die with him. You know, the greatest proof of the resurrection is the disciples gave their life for Jesus because they saw him alive. And remember, right before he gave them the Great Commission, it says some of them still doubted, which means it's okay for you and me, but it's just not okay to stay there. Living beyond the resurrection is getting to the point where we believe he is who he says he is, and then we go and we give our lives for it. Because it's more important than anything else. But you've got to push through some times where you go, I don't know about this, and I'm not sure about that, and this situation wouldn't happen if God is God. He's still God, and he still sits on the throne. And he still desires to make himself known. you just got to draw close to him. And as you draw close to him, check out all the evidence he gives you. Don't take my word for it. Take his word for it. And just go to the book. So you get to the point where you say, I struggle with things, but you're still my Lord. And you're my God. God, today in this room, there are people that struggle with doubt. Maybe they've been told all their life, they just shouldn't doubt. Instead, this morning, would you take them from a place of doubting to a place where they have a stronger devotion in you? God, I pray that you would do what you did in Thomas's heart where he said he won't believe. that There may be somebody in this room right now, that's their attitude. I won't believe. I'll never believe. Would you please reveal yourself to them? Would you step into their lives this morning and say, peace, be still? And would you flood their soul with peace? God, if there's people in this room that they at one time were closer to you than they are right now. At one time, they had more passion for you than they have right now. At one time, they had more zeal for you than they have right now. Did you take them back to the garden, back to the place of their conversion experience where it all started? And would you walk with them and talk with them and tell them, hey, you're mine, you're my own. Would you bring us all to a point this morning where we can mean it when we say it? You're my Lord and my God. Would you make it personal to everybody in the room? Because what happened on the Easter Sunday changes everything and has the power to change everyone. So may they experience your peace today more than anything else. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet?